Good evening. Welcome to Milkshake Monday, episode 233, Out of the Abundance. I always like to give you a background of knowing how the teaching came about, how the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart about what he wanted to teach. And this happened last week while I was working out, and I actually saw myself teaching at a location, and I was teaching the subject out of the abundance. And I said, okay, I kept working out and I kept saying out of the abundance. And I said, and out of the abundance was one of the first scriptures as I was a young believer, out of the abundance of your mouth, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks, Matthew 12, 34. And I'll reference that later. But I started thinking about it and I kept thinking about it and I write notes on my board and I started writing notes and texts to myself. And here's the thing. Whenever I find myself unbalanced, there's some thinking that's out of alignment or emotions I'm feeling, I always have to do a pulse check of what I'm pouring into my spirit and what is seeping out. Because like it says, your heart and what your mouth is speaking, something's going in there. So I even compared it because last week I finally started checking on this tire that every couple weeks I kept having this low tire and it was the same tire and at first I was justifying it saying because we'd had some cold weather my SUV was having this tire situation of tire pressure but then ultimately I found out no it's consistent you have some leak somewhere and you need to either fix it or get a new tire so they were found it out that I did have a slow leak and they patched it and I haven't had the issues since well sometimes when you find that in your life and I believe this is for somebody specifically and a lot of somebodies that when you start to see behaviors and attitudes and things coming out of your mouth and the way you're thinking and how you may be in a funk or you are just not in the right alignment with the Lord, you really have to take a pulse of your pressure, your heart pressure and find out what have you been pouring in. So part of this out of the abundance is for us to do a check. And the thing that I wanted to also start with is to talk about our thinking, because when it comes to our heart and what we find that we are having emotions about, and I have this thing about the three C's, don't find yourself comparing other people because God made you unique. Don't find yourself complaining and make sure that you don't find yourself compromising on the things that the Lord has given you to do and what he wants you to have as your truth monitor what he has in the scriptures. So those three C's, you always kind of kind of check yourself. And when you start to see there's some kind of imbalance in your life, in your thinking, in your perspective, in your behaviors, and what's coming out of your mouth, check what you're pouring in and what you have an overflow of, because it's going to tell on you somehow. So let's go to the first scripture, which is Philippians chapter four, verses eight. And I'm going to read this out of the living translation, because I want you to always keep in mind when it comes to you and I, and you're the one that's going to be with you all the time, not me. God and you are going to always be hand in glove together. So he says in this scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit to the brethren, which is you and I, sisters and brothers, about what we should be thinking on. And I want you to keep a pulse of that as you go through your daily living. What are you thinking about? Because as we start talking about these examples of abundance and the different things that are going on in our life and what's poured into our heart and what's coming out of our mouth, out of the abundance, it's starting from what's in your mind and what you're thinking on. So the first scripture says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, Think on these things. And as we keep talking about things that we're seeing on the news, things that we say are not true or are true, people believing lies, all this stuff is coming up now because we're in the last days. But the key thing is seek the Lord, seek the spirit of God, seek the wisdom of God to find out what is true and what is false. Do not be fooled by people that don't mean you any good and who are part of the antichrist movement because they do not believe in God. Now, the greatest example that all of us should follow is Jesus Christ. And I said, the thing about Christ, no matter what was going on in his life experience, in those 33 and a half years, and those three and a half years of ministry that we here talked about, from the time that we see him as a young boy who was found in the synagogue 
and he's about his father's business until he's taking the last breaths on the cross. And then he's going from Acts 2 up into heaven and he's intercepting and talking to Paul on the Damascus Road. All those things. He's always in concert and alignment with his father. But think about what we've always seen in the Gospels, that he rose up early in the morning to have prayer with his Lord, his father. In the evening, and even where we're going to find this passage now, because here's the thing, more and more people that I have had interaction with of late are in a, in a situation of going through some kind of depression. And it's not just because I'm a new widow and I'm seeing people who are grieving. There are people who are going through some situations in their lives where they're feeling an abundance of being overwhelmed and sadness and sorrowfulness and depression and anxiety and all those types of emotions. But I want you to see that even our Lord Jesus Christ, as he's going to the Garden of Gethsemane, which we know is right before he's going to yield up his spirit and he's going to sacrifice himself for our salvation. And we're getting ready to celebrate, uh, celebrate Easter, but I want you to see some of these things. So I want you to see how our own Lord through his own prayer life was able to combat the situation of feeling grieved and distressed and sadness and being overwhelmingly sorrowful. He has, he has human and deity together and all those emotions that we have the ability to feel, he can feel in himself, but he knew no sin. So let's go to Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46, and I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and told his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him and began to be grieved and distressed. The abundance of what he was feeling, he's sharing in this inspired word of God to see this. He was feeling grieved and distressed. Having those feelings wasn't sinful because Christ never sinned. So to have those type of feelings was a part of the natural makeup of the human body and the human experience. So don't cream people because they're having emotions. Let them share that emotions, but tell them when you have an abundance of those type of emotions, you still have to seek the Lord and pray. Just as Christ as our example is doing. So here's the next verse in verse 38. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. It's sensing what is about to happen in this sorrow and this distress and there's grief there. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed. He's praying, he's praying. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he's keeping praying himself and he's telling us, watch and pray. Because there's some things that are going to come into your life that are going to be temptations, that are going to be overwhelming, that are going to be grieving, that are going to be stressful, that are going to be overwhelming. Pray. But your flesh is not going to want to pray because Satan doesn't want you to get connected to the link, connected to the vine, connected to the power. But Christ kept praying three times, praying and praying and praying. And it says here, he went away again a second time and prayed, saying, my father. Father, who is he going to? His father, who should we be going through? Our father. That's why that disciples prayer we see in Matthew 6. Here's the, the way that you do it. Go to our father. My father, if this cup cannot pass away unless I drink from it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time. Keep praying, keep praying. When your abundance is leaking, when your abundance is sad, when your abundance is sorrowful, when your abundance is depressed, when the abundance of that heart is not right, imbalanced, you're upside down. As Christ's example, keep praying, keep praying, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the son of man is being betrayed into 
at the hands of sinners. Now, here's something I'm going to say over and over in the next few minutes. Get up. Let's go and behold. I'm going to say it because when you find that you are in a situation where your abundance of whatever's going on in your heart is not joy and peace and all the things that we say are the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, I want you to keep saying to yourself, get up, let's go and behold. Get up, let's go and behold. Because we have to continue to get up. We have to continue to keep praying and seeking God and going and doing what thus saith the Lord. And then it says, behold, and look what he says, see, he's going to say, see, the betrayer is near. And there's some situations that are in your life that they are near, but guess what? He's letting you know, you got to be prayed up for those temptations. You got to be prayed up for those situations. You have to be prayed up and going to the father. And if he's not letting that cup pass, pass, like he said with Christ, Christ says, not my will, but thy will be done, but you got to get up. And you got to let's go and you got to go behold. And here he says, get up, let's go. Behold, the one who is betraying me is near. But he's prayed up. Now let's go to the next scripture. Because you may say, oh, that's not, you know, I am telling the people who are listening, because I know there are a lot of people that listen who I talk to regularly. And I'm giving these first two because some of these people that listen on Facebook or the podcast or YouTube, they're feeling low and they're using these teachings to help them. And so I'm going to the very core of where they're struggling. So they know that out of the abundance, there are things in the scripture to show the abundance of what could be in your heart is a lot of things that God said, you got to pray about this. And he's not saying it doesn't exist. He doesn't say it's not important. He's not saying there is no solution. He is the solution. You going to a therapist, a counselor, a life coach, you getting medication, all of that is a part of the solution. But don't leave out God. Don't leave out your connection to the Lord. So in this case, we're going to talk about Hagar. And I have talked about some of this over the years, but I'm putting it out there because more and more people, and I know there's a reason why God told me to talk about out of the abundance tonight. So if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, I want you to see there's a married woman who is infertile at this point. She's getting taunted, which is the same thing as being bullied. And it's not happening just once. It's happening over year after year. And she is in the abundance of feeling sorrowful. She's feeling like she's not having great self-esteem. She feels like she's inadequate as a woman who cannot bear children. And she's comparing herself to the other wife, Panana. And all these things are going on. She has an abundance where she's so overwhelmed to the point she's sick and distressed and depressed and she can't eat and things are out of alignment. But I won't be able to read all this, but I want you to take the time to read that whole chapter because how she gets back into alignment and gets her heart full is she has to start praying. Whatever she had been doing in the years past, something was different this time that she went into prayer mode as Christ did into prayer mode and she prayed and Eli misunderstood that prayer, but God understood the prayer that something was changed in this woman and he opened her womb. So let's look at what was overwhelming her. I wish I could do all the before and afters and read everything, but there's some befores and afters. We saw what happened with Christ. He was there, but when it was time, he yielded up his spirit. He said, it's finished. His before, he was at the Garden of Gethsemane, but he was at that cross and he said, it is finished. Now look what it says here. And though he loved Hannah, that's the husband who knew his wife was barren at that point. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So Peninnah, which would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Peninnah would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Now, I want you to understand something. When you find that you are not understanding who you are in the Lord, 
and the circumstances around you, even though they are not what you may want. She wanted children. She didn't have children. She wanted to feel as though she was having that family that she saw her husband with his other wife having. The taunting was attacking her self-esteem. The person that was in her life, and there are people in your life that may call you ugly and fat and stupid and all these things, that doesn't make it so. But when your heart is full of things that are not of who God sees you, when that taunt comes, when that attack from the enemy comes, it lands. It lands because you're not prayed up. And guess what? Even when you're praying, you still believe in the lie. What you're thinking on, like we talked about, what is the things that are true? You're not believing what God says is true because he says you're made in the image and likeness of him. But you're thinking you're ugly, you're fat, you're dumb, you're stupid. That's not what's true. What is honest and what is lovely and just and of good report, those things are not in your mind because you're believing what the lie of the devil and the lie of the, the people bullying you and taunting you. And even if they're in your family circle, it's not true because God has told you he's made you and God does not make junk. And it says that in John 1, that Jesus made everything. And it says in Psalm 139 that he knew you and fashioned you informed you and made you and know the substance of your days. So you're not junk. You're not ugly. You're not worthless. All these lies are the devil. But in this time, she got so reduced to tears and couldn't eat because she was believing the lie. The abundance of what was in her heart was, I believe I'm inadequate. I'm nothing because I'm not a woman that can bear a child. And she had to get to the point, even at the whys, because her husband comes back and asks her, why are you crying? And even in the abundance of people coming, why are you like that? Why are you with that man? Why are you always talking like this? Why you don't have this? Why you don't have that? Why you look like that? Why are you so overweight? Why you don't have the job? Why? All that whys are overwhelming. And you have to just pause and say, I need to think on the things that are going to elevate and bring me to the knowledge of who God sees me to be and wants me to be. Because if I keep listening to the taunts and the whys in my life, it's going to bring me down because that's not a good report. And that's not helping me. But look at this last verse eight. I got to move on. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? See how he kind of dismissed what she was feeling? It was just why, why, why? And some people are going to dismiss what you're feeling because they don't understand how heavy your heart is because they they don't understand that you are in a place where you need to get plugged on to God because you are going through distress and grief and sorrow. And the abundance of your heart is not full of the fruit of the spirit. It's full of what the devil is trying to bring you down and make you think that you are below and you are beneath. And you're not who God loves and who's created and says, I'm with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. That you are made in my image, in my likeness. And I love you enough to send my son. But anyway, this question goes on and you have to keep reading this chapter. Let's move on. Now we're going to look at the abundance of some ungodly people in your life that do not love God. And I'm telling you this to make it plain. There are some people in your space, in your life, in your influence that you are allowing them to have great access to you. And when they are very clear to tell you, they don't give a crap about God. But you're giving them all this time to pour into you, to pour into you. And all of a sudden you wonder why your behaviors, your attitude, your speech, you're depressed, you're downhearted, you're, all this stuff is happening because you're letting people that are openly hostile and don't give a flip about the Lord Jesus Christ or the Bible. And there's, they think what you are into is stupid and you're foolish and you're lazy. And guess what? When you tell them you want to worship and you want to do things about the Lord and about the Lord's business, they're like, uh-uh, I'm going to do everything I can to get you not focused and distracted. And guess what? The whole purpose is 
for you to do what they want you to do. They want you to work for the devil. They want you to work for what they want you to work for, but they don't want you to worship God. They don't want you to praise God. They don't want you to do anything about God, but they want you to do everything about what they want you to do. They got time for everything else except for worshiping God and the abundance that they have, which they don't believe in God. They don't want to worship God. They don't want to do anything about God. But you can't see it because you're so enamored and you're so pouring into all that they want and you're not realizing you need to be plugged into the Lord. So let's go to Exodus chapter five, verses one through nine. Pharaoh going to be plain about this. I'm trying to make this plain so you can see what's happening out of the abundance of what's around you and why your heart is filled with what it's filled with. It says first one of chapter five of Exodus. After this prep presentation to Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Is that so? Retorted Pharaoh. And who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. There are people in your life saying, I don't know the Lord. And is that so? God wants you to go to worship. God wants you to give. God wants you to pray. God wants you to forsake fornication, adultery, all this stuff. God, is that so? Really? But Aaron and Moses persisted. The God of the Hebrews has met with us, they declared. So let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness so we can offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. If we don't, he will kill us with a plague or with a sword. Pharaoh replied, Moses and Aaron, why are you distracting the people from their task? He's all about his work. He's all about what he wants. And the people in your life that don't know the Lord are all about what they want, the task, the work that they want you to do. They want you to make money so you can pay their bills. They want you to make money so you can go party. They want you to make money so you can take them to do evil things. All about them, not about you and definitely not about God. Get back to work. Look, there are many of your people in the land and you are stopping them from the work. That same day, Pharaoh sent this order to the Egyptian slave drivers and the Israelite foremen. Do not supply any more straw for making brick. Make the people get, get it themselves, but still require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That's why they're crying out. Let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. He couldn't stand the thought that they wanted to sacrifice anything to God and not be praising him and doing his work. It says, let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Load them down and more work. Load them down with more work. Make them sweat. And some of the people in your life want to make you sweat. They want to make you uncomfortable. Oh, baby, if you want to go to that church, I don't want nothing to do with you. Well, let them go. Bye, Felicia. If they don't want you to be about the work of the Lord, about the worship of the Lord, they're not the right people for you. And at the end of this, I'm going to tell you, there's some people that y'all need to start saying goodbye to. Literally goodbye to, because if they ain't going to be in heaven, it is a long goodbye. Make them sweat. That will teach them to listen to, that will teach them to listen to lies. Now, why would he think to worship God is a lie? But that's what some of the people in your life who want to give you an abundance of crap think that all the things about the Lord are lies. Now, let's go to Paul. Paul, we knew that in a time where he was trained as a Pharisee, that the abundance of what he knew was religious. He was working with the chief priest and he was getting letters when Christ saw him on the Damascus Road. He was holding the coats of those who at the martyr of Stephen. So we understand that there was a time where his abundance was all about what he thought he was, was really full of conviction for, which was wrong. But we see toward the, after the interaction that he had with the Lord Jesus Christ on the Damascus road, the change, his calling, what he knew he would have to do, but I wanted to show you that even, I couldn't pick all, there's so, so much that Paul wrote in the epistles, but we're going to go to Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 29, because 
after he was filled with the knowledge of who Christ was, the Holy Spirit was using him as he started to go around and see the idols and see where even one that says the unknown God, he wanted to make it plain what was in his heart at this point. And I think this passage is one that's clear because it shares a good, a good picture of what was full of his, in his heart at this point and, and how he had started to learn about the truth, the honest word of God, the good report. So let's start at verse 22. So Paul's standing before the council Address them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you're very religious and some people are very religious. The abundance of their heart is legalism, but it's not faith and trust in God, but it's a lot of legalism. But these people seem to be religious, but without the knowledge they need. So he's going to help them. That you're very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it, to the unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in, ma in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve his needs. For he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything. And he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall. And he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God. And perhaps feel their way toward him and find him though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. And some of your own poets have said, we are his offering. And since this is true, remember, think of what's true. We shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. And see, Paul used to have an abundance of mess misunderstanding of who Christ is and was. But when Christ met him, the abundance of him understanding him from John 1, 1 until everything regarding the salvation story from Genesis to Revelation, he, he understood pieces of what was going on because Christ was giving him that knowledge. Remember when he didn't have a sight and it was an interaction that he was knowing what was going on and God was filling him and telling him things. So his abundance was becoming more and more of Christ. Now here's an example of another circumstance where there's an abundance of a rich man who had a lot of luxury. But look, his abundance was of the wrong things. And I want to give some caution to those of you that think you just pass by these types of teachings. I don't need God. I got plenty. I got house. I got money. I got family. I got husband, wife, girlfriend, whatever you think you have. But if you don't find yourself knowing God, the abundance of what you think here on earth is not going to be a U-Haul that's going to translate to the eternity. You're going to find yourself in hell and there ain't going to be no U-Haul, ain't going to be no ATM, no bank account, no lights, no, no air conditioning. And this is what's going to be found out by this parable that we talk about, Lazarus and this rich man. We're going to be in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. He is going to be shown all of the abundance he had, but he had it in the wrong thing. And too late when you're in hell to realize this. You can have the abundance of all the things you want in this life because God has given us all free will. But there's an accountability at the end of this natural life where this little shell is going back to the dirt. And the accountability is an eternity either with God or separated from him for all eternity. And this is what this man is going to find out. His abundance was in the wrong place. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat. Look at that. This poor man was longing just to eat. His abundance that he had was starvation and sickness and disease, but he still trusted God. In the midst of his lack he still trusted God and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. 
Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. He's receiving the abundance of hell based on what he had as the abundance of not having anything related to Christ, but all that he wanted in his luxury. None of it was Christ. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime, I want to put in abundance of everything, luxury. You receive good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here. Based on his trust and abundance of who Christ was, of the Lord, he's comforted for all eternity here in heaven. And you are in agony in hell. Eternal hell, agony, hot, fire, not comfortable. Rich man's not finding it comfortable. And besides all this, between us and you are a great chasm has been set in place so that you who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. All that purgatory talk is not true. It's not of the word of God. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. What you're going to find People in the luxury of abundance here in this natural plane, they think they got all the playtime in the world and all the stuff they've heard about hell and heaven don't matter. They ain't got time for it. That's all somebody else. They're going to be distracted by what Satan is whispering in the ear. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Bad chance. There's a lot of gospel being proclaimed on all these social media platforms, every type of platform. And there are a lot of people saying, I could care less, got better things to do. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone from rise from the dead. <coughs> the scripture about uh, the abundance of the mouth, the heart, the mouth speaks is coming from Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Oh, generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, I'm getting ready to close this. I'm going to give you some things to think about. Peter is a great example. Peter, when the Lord asks Peter and Andrew and the disciples to follow him, think about this and you go read the Gospels yourself and even the uh, Acts and all the other parts of the um, New Testament. Peter was a businessman who had a fisherman. He was a fisherman. So he knew about fishing. He knew about the sea. He knew about boats. He knew about nets. But I want you to think about this. The abundance of Peter's knowledge before he met Christ was those things. Christ, after there was an interaction and exchange and day-to-day -day and teaching and proclaiming and sending Peter and the disciples out and showing miracles and prayer life and all kinds of things. Yes, Christ said you'll be fishers of men. The sea that he used to fish on with the boats, he walked on water. That's not what he knew before Christ. He saw a storm come that made him and the disciples so afraid. He said, don't you care that we perish? Care us not that we perish? And Christ got up and rebuked the storm and said, be still. He'd never seen that before. He saw a time where he had gone out fishing all night long and he was tired and he was done. And Christ said, no, let that net on that side, that right side. And fish jumped. His creations jumped in the net to the point they were breaking. He had to call his partners over. He hadn't seen that before Christ. He had never seen a fish have his tax payment, have a jewel in his mouth that Christ said, go get this fish and find that, that fish. And that fish had jewelry. And that piece of jewel, jewelry is going to be enough to pay the taxes for us, the temple tax, right? He hadn't seen that. The thing about it, 
Before you know Christ, there are things that you think you know about this life. But when God gives you the revelation of who he is and his scriptures start to give you knowledge, there are things in your life that he will reveal to you that will give you the abundance of understanding what is true, what is honest, those faithful teachings that he has that are from the inspired word of God. But there's a before and after. There's a before Christ meets you in the place of you repenting and surrendering your life. And there's an after, but the abundance of the after is always remembering like he with his father, when you go through some challenges, he's gonna say, get up, let's go. And behold, get up, let's go and behold. But you gotta pray, you gotta get connected to the vine, you gotta get connected to the father. You gotta say, not my will, but thy will be done. But you have to understand, that yes, like Christ, the betrayer was coming to him and he was near. But there's some situations in your life that are near you. But unless you get your abundance to be filled with the things of the Lord, the knowledge of God, the prayer life, the connection to the Father, the relationship, not religion, but the relationship with Christ, the Holy Spirit being your comforter, to be right there with you as you go through. So you can say, I'm getting up, I'm going, and I'm ready to behold and see what God's gonna do, even in the midst of my situation. The last scripture about Peter that I wanted you to see is that Peter would deny Christ, y'all know that. We we're talking about all the things leading up to Easter. Peter's abundance not with, was not just fishing and what I told you about, but it was also he was had an abundance in his heart of arrogance and pride. And the scriptures will show you, go to the gospels, that he didn't know himself. And some of us don't know who we really are until Christ reveals to us. Just like that rich young ruler, one thing you lack. Peter had a knowledge of being with Christ and doing all the miracles and being a great disciple in his mind. And he was puffed up and prideful, think I'm going to be the one that's going to stay with you. You telling me one thing, I don't believe you. You don't know what you're talking about, Christ. And Christ is trying to tell many of us, we think we know ourselves, but Christ knows what's inside our heart. And he's continuing to pour in his spirit and pour in the word of God so we can get some garbage out. Peter had some prejudices that you'll see that Paul had to confront. But in the time when he denies Christ, he did not, he did not really believe Christ. And until that rooster crowed on that third denial, he was broken. He had to repent and cry, but Christ restored him. And after that restoration, he found himself in Acts 2, where the Holy Spirit's going to come upon him. And he's going to talk. And he's going to talk to the point that you're going to hear these words. I'm not going to read them all, but to the point that people get saved. And some of you, when you get connected in the abundance of what Christ wants to teach you and influence you and the spirit is going to give you to pour into you. It's for the salvation of many that you didn't even realize were waiting to hear from you that God is going to put into your path, but it's going to be out of the abundance of you pouring him in and not the garbage that you've been allowing in. Look at what Peter says in Acts 2 verses 37 through 41. When the people heard this, which you got to read what he had been saying before verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, convicted. Some people you have got in your life are ready to be convicted. Pray on that. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This is now. Your words from the Lord, once you start pouring him in, in the abundance of your heart that you're speaking, to the people in your influence that God is going to bring in are going to be for the call of God on their lives. You are the intermediary that God is going to use for the salvation of people in your lives that he wants to bring in. 
It says, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The Holy Spirit is just as powerful as he was on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. We have got to proclaim in the Spirit of God, the Word of God, to plead with the people in our influence about the things of God. When the part that we have, the abundance of our heart, is pouring out what the Holy Spirit wants to speak to these people, they will be changed. They will come. But if our abundance is our own self, our selfish ambition, what we want to say, God didn't say our words were not going to return void. He said his word would not return void. And I say this in summary and listen to me real quickly. There's a lot that we're thinking on, but I'm going to say a few things and I'm trying to be a little bit cute when I say this little phrase that I'm put together. Don't commit your mind and your spirit to the Wealth Fargo's, the TJ Maxx's, the 18 holes, the double D's, the hennies and the crowns, the vapes, the rocks, the blunts, the toots, the mega zeros, the LB, all the Q, or the beating up of your booze to black and blue or carrying the nine millimeters for the NRA and the killing and the criming and the love don't cost because Christ's love is free. But he says to us in Matthew 6, you cannot serve God and mammon. You will hate the one and love the other. And we see a lot of people loving mammon. And the abundance of what's around them is all about the mammon. But this is a corrupt generation and we're in the last days, saints. Saints of God. We have to really be in tune with the word of God and start to, to really believe what we're hearing out of Philippians 4, 8. Because... There's a lot of stuff getting ready to happen. We're getting ready to start another election cycle and there's going to be a lot of lying again. And I just pray that the saints of God will tune into Holy, to the Holy Spirit. And I just want you to take an inventory of what you have in your abundance. This is between you and God, not me, you and God. You know what's in your mind. You know what's coming out of your mouth and you know what you're pouring into your heart. And I want to say again, there are some people, some somebodies in your lives that you need to start saying some goodbyes to. Because guess what? They're like Pharaoh. They don't believe in God. They don't care about God. And as you witness to them over and over again, and some of them got your DNA, nobody's saying you can't put them on God's altar and you can't be praying for them, but you can't let them pour in the sickness of their disbelief, unbelief, and their questioning, and their all that filth that they have that they're given to you. Because guess what? It's going to be some long goodbyes for some of them. Eternal goodbyes. And there's some people that you need to spend more time with now to tell them about the things of God like you saw Peter for them to get saved and receive the message of truth. And you plead with them and they come and say, I surrender. I want to, I want to get to know God. Because those are the people that you won't be saying goodbye to. You'll be saying someday so long and I'll see you in the, in the, in the future in heaven with our glorified bodies praising God around his altar. But for some of y'all, y'all need to take some time to say some goodbyes. Because out of the abundance, you want to make sure that your heart is full of the Lord and full of who he is, which is love and peace and mercy and grace and truth. I love you and Lord willing, I will see you next week. Thank you. God bless you.